Hello, okay, so this is a rocket engine, but it's not really, it, it's, it's a model and uh, it's printed out of plastic. But in today's video, we're gonna talk about 3D printed metal rocket engines real ones. We're going to stop by the Velo booth at Rapid TCT 2023 and we're going to talk with Jay about his self-designed ramjet. So let's get started. Coverage for this year's Rapid TCT in Chicago is brought to you by LDO Motors. For printer parts, kits, accessories and more, check them out in the link in the description. Okay, so we're at Rapid TCT 2023 and we're going to do something a little bit different here. We are totally going to nerd out about rocket science with Jay here. Uh, from Velo 3D, and this is a ramjet, and you actually designed this thing in college, and now it's here. So, yeah. what exactly is a ramjet? How did Velo make this? Because this is all metal 3D printed. Yeah. And how does a ramjet work? Because we're just going to nerd out about rocket science. Uh, so, this is a ramjet engine, uh, as previously mentioned. You're looking at a cross-sectional view of the internals of the engine itself. Uh, so, basically what's happening here, as you have supersonic airflow uh, basically coming into contact with the inlet spike, you're offsetting an oblique shock wave. And so as that oblique shock wave comes into this inlet here, uh, it basically deflects off the wall. And what you're doing there is you are ultimately diffusing that kinetic energy of the shock wave. Uh, so you're decelerating that airflow to a subsonic speed uh, where then you can inject fuel, combust it subsonically, and then re-accelerate it through the nozzle here uh, to a supersonic speed. So what happens, so you have to decelerate the air from supersonic to subsonic to combust it. What happens if you try to combust it at supersonic speeds? Is that So that brings a lot of challenges. Uh, so you need a lot more pressure uh, to inject that fuel in such a way that you can get um, you know, a good combustion okay. reaction. Um, so there's, a lot of research uh, that's currently going into kind of supersonic, combust uh, supersonic combustion. So it's, it's one of those things that if they could do it, it would be better. It's just it's so hard to do. Nobody yeah, so, does it right now. so that's the main differentiator between a ramjet and a scramjet. So a ramjet basically is a su subsonic combusting engine. Um, okay. And then you have the scramjet, which is a supersonic combusting okay. ramjet. This is a really cool part. Uh, that was 3D printed. Uh, so traditionally manufacturing something like this, you would have you know, tens, potentially hundreds of different individual pieces that you would either have to weld together or braze together, um, which would be you know, really substantial amount of lead time, right, to, to get a full part. So um, the beauty of this part right here is that a lot of components are consolidated into one single unit, right? Yeah, so you this, have- This is all one solid unit. This here. is all one solid piece, right? So you have this inlet spike, uh, which traditionally would be its own piece. Um, you know, you have these uh, flow passages, which you know you would, have to, you would have to manufacture as individual pieces as well. Now, would um, this be for fuel or air or yeah, what? Yeah, so that's another thing. Uh, another advantage of 3D printing is that you can you know, have complex internal architecture yeah. that you previously would not be able to manufacture, right? So this volume um, in other uh, manufacturing processes would not be able to be utilized, right? Okay. So what's actually happening here is you would inject fuel, it would go up the flow passage, basically it would evap or evacuate uh, some of the thermal energy that's up here uh, that's created by the aerodynamic heating of that oblique shockwave being set off and then it's rerouted down, and then it's sent out perpendicularly into the airflow that's being sent to the- And the does it auto ignite, or would there be an igniter in here? Yeah, so basically you would have like a spark plug or an array of spark plugs okay. that would, uh, you know, obviously maintain your combustion. Yes. Um, so you have yeah. supersonic air coming in, it decelerates here. Yep. And what are these holes here for? Because there's a bunch of holes yeah, so on the outside. This is uh, basically a, an array of perforations on this wall here. Okay. Um, this is a neat little feature because as I mentioned, you really want to decrease that kinetic energy of the incoming shock wave as quickly as you can. And so with this perforation, this actually acts as a boundary layer bleed. So what okay. you're doing is as that shock wave is deflecting off, uh, 
a lot of that air, that boundary layer is actually being bled into this uh, central volume here. And so that air is actually getting redirected down and then it gets injected into the wake of the flame holder. Okay. And there's a lot of research out there um, that points to having bleed air injecting into the wake of the flame holder, uh, increasing your combustion efficiency, but also reducing the parasitic drag on the engine. Okay, so is, is it kind of like an afterburn, like an internal afterburn type setup? Um, or? No, it's just air, it's not fuel, right? It's just air, right. Okay. So you're basically reducing the pressure drop from the leading edge of the flame holder to the trailing edge of the flame holder. Okay. So less drag, ultimately. Okay, so you have supersonic come in, air come in, you slow it down, you can bust it, and then you get way more force coming out the back. Exactly. Right? Okay. That would be the thrust that you're generating with the engine. And it looks like, because this is all, again, one single 3D print, there's veins all through here. Is this cooling running through here, or would this be yeah, air? So, yeah, so you would have some you know, kind of coolant loop that okay. uh, you would also be evacuating a lot of that aerodynamic heating that's happening at the surface of the part. Yeah, because um, it's going to heat up a lot, right? right? Exactly, exactly. And this is Inconel? This is printed in Inconel 718. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So what kind of machine makes this? Because that's, we're here at Velo, they yeah. do metal 3D printing. So yes, what kind do. of metal 3D printing? Yeah. It? So there's different types. Uh, this part was printed on Velo 3D's Sapphire um, 1MZ. So that is basically um, a 300 millimeter diameter build plate that you can extrude all the way up to a full meter in Z. Velo 3D specializes in laser powder bed fusion. Okay. And for those that don't know, essentially the way the process works, is you dispense a layer of powder, metal powder, yep. um, onto the build plane, and then you essentially use lasers to center or weld that metal powder to the existing part. And then you do that so many thousands of times okay. until you positively extrude a full piece. So after each pass of the laser, it lays out a fresh bed. Yep. And then it, now, do you need supports doing that? Some cases you do need supports. Uh, we have advanced hardware that actually allows us to print a lot of geometries without support. So we have a non-contact recoder, uh, which enables us to really print more complex geometries without support. Um, yeah. So. Now, does the build platform move or the laser move, or is it is everything's fixed in position? Yeah, so, so basically you have an elevator, okay. and as you're doing your recoat and your lasing passes, the elevator drops down by 50 microns okay. each time. And so we print in 50 micron increments. Okay, awesome. And what kind of XY resolution are you talking at? Uh, so our positional accuracy, uh, we typically have it on the order of 25 to 30 microns. So okay. about a thousandth of an inch. And and so this was the one size machine. How big of a machine does Velo have? How big can you go with Yeah, our, our largest platform actually is our Sapphire XC1MZ. So essentially that's a 600 millimeter diameter build plate and then you can extrude that to a full meter in Z. And that's a circular build volume, That's correct? a or circular, cylinder, yeah, yep. Okay, now is there a reason it's cylindrical versus square, or is it because of the... So a lot of people in the, in the industry, they are printing on square or rectangular build plates. Uh, when we first started you know, talking to customers and, and kind of the people that initially invested in us, uh, they were very interested in printing rotating components and things that were more circular, uh, so pump housings, things like that. Okay. Uh, so that kind of, you know, pointed us in the direction of having a, a circular build plate versus and a rectangular one. When, so when doing this, you need to be in an environment with like no oxygen. So are you using like argon to? Yeah. So we uh, actually have a fully inert environment. It's positive pressure argon that we run through the chamber. So okay. we run that linearly over the powder bed. Um, basically, as you are lasing and kind of centering this metal together, there's a lot of soot that's actually generated. Okay. And uh, in some cases, it can actually be reactive. So, um, you know, it's really important, A, to prevent some sort of, you know, reactive thermal runaway, okay. something like that. Uh, but also, that soot that gets generated, if it's not effectively evacuated from the powder bed, and you laze on top of that soot, that could actually lead to some sort of metallurgical defect in the part. Okay. Yeah, because... So, can you can you weld this metal after it, it's done? Like, are you able to? Yeah, a lot of fix the, it? Yeah, a lot of the materials that we print in um, are welded into you know other assemblies and things okay. like that after after they're machined and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely, we welded. Earlier we were talking about overhangs, and you have the shield here. Yeah. And. This was printed without support, correct? It was, yeah. So this was, I don't know what the exact angle is, but 
That's yeah. that's a pretty beefy overhang, and this got some weight to it. Oh yeah. Is this that's also in canal? That's an in canal seven eighteen, and that uh, surface actually goes down to zero degrees. It goes. So, oh, okay. Yeah. And um, how how thick is it? It's not much to it. I think it's about three millimeters thickness. Awesome. And these brackets are welded on, so yeah. you can weld to this. Yeah, you can weld to it pretty easily. Um, aside from it being a very cool marketing piece, uh, <laughs> celebrating the recent Captain America movie. Um, this is actually a really powerful uh, demonstration part in the sense that if we were printing like a propellant tank or some sort of pressure vessel uh, that does kind of have that dome closure geometry. Oh, at the, at the top there, yep. At the top there. Um, on other systems, you would need to support that yep. surface, right? Um, and so if you're supporting that surface, obviously in a propellant tank or a pressure vessel, you would not physically be able to access the supports yeah, uh, it, inside it's, it's, it's right. sealed in. Exactly, it's sealed in there. So uh, this is really powerful in the sense that, you know, we can print these closures on those kinds of parts uh, without support. Yeah. So you don't need to worry about, you know, trying to remove things or having, um, you know, additional material just being left in there. Yeah, and they're, they're, uh, this is solid, right? Like now, yeah. would, would, this, would this be able to resist the same sort of internal forces as a, a vertical wall at the, of the same thickness, or would you run into... Would yeah, you have yeah. to make it thicker to compensate? To yeah, the and I mean, that, you know, is kind of like a, a design consideration, okay, uh, so. depending on the application, what, okay. you know, obviously pressure you're going to be trying to contain. Um, but, yeah, we uh, can print material that's 99.9% .9 dense. That's what we claim on all of our uh, qualified materials. And, and was this hand finished or is, is this? We did some hand polishing on this. Okay. Yep, yep. So it doesn't just have to be a big honking rocket engine that you're making on here. You could do really small detail. Like we have some chain mail here yeah. that was done on one of the machines and this is, this is small. What other common applications is this system used for um, outside of rocket engines essentially? Yeah, so we print everything from rocket engines to uh, components for oil and gas. Uh, we print things for Formula One. So heat sinks, heat exchangers, things like that. Okay. So this is the volume of your, your largest one, correct? Yeah. Okay. So this is the build volume for our Sapphire XC1MZ platform. Essentially, that's a 600 millimeter diameter uh, by a meter in Z. Okay. So this, obviously, you can do a lot with this. A lot of our customers are using this to print very large nozzles for private sector space applications. So can you say what companies have done what with this? A company that actually utilizes this full height uh, and this full build volume is uh, Launcher. And so they're a private sector space company basically developing engines uh, for orbital vehicles and launch okay. vehicles. And what they use this for is actually printing their nozzle. So the entire nozzle the entire itself is done on this? Yep. Okay, yeah. awesome. So when printing something this large, is there anything you have to worry about for like uh, the density or the amount of mass per layer when it comes to like heat generation or anything like that. So you, you could print this solid if you really wanted to. Yeah, it's you... not so much a concern of the weight, but more so the energy input, okay. right? So you may run into kind of some overheating event uh, just because you know, you're throwing so much energy at this part. Um, but that would probably be the only thing that you'd really need to worry about. And you is, can just adjust the settings so that you, doesn't happen. Yeah, right. So if you were to print something, for example, a rocket nozzle to this size, yeah. how long would that take roughly? Depends on the geometry, but uh, I mean, we've printed nozzles at full height four to five days. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. And Other geometries take a little bit longer depending on some of the cooling architecture and things like that. And that's again at that 0.5 millimeter layer height? Or 0.05? 50 micron layer 50 height. micron layer yeah. height. Awesome. So that is chatting about rockets with Velo. Yeah. Cheers. There you go. Thanks, yeah. sweet. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that video and I hope you learned something new because I know I sure did. I want to say thank you again to Jay from Velo 3D for taking the time to talk to me at this year's Rapid TCT. And also I want to give a huge shout out to LDO Motors for sponsoring this year's trip. If you want to help support the channel, the content I create and the things I do, link in the video description as well. And also while you're down there, don't forget to like that smash button. And if you don't want to miss out on future content such as this, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Take care and cheers.